All right, so I wanted to do a video on the parable of the redemption of Zion. It's important that we understand that even though we talk about the fact that we are gathering now to the stakes of Zion, that that's not completely correct because we can't be gathering to the stakes of Zion because we don't have Zion. Um, and Christ himself tells us that. Um, in Doctrine and Covenant section 101. So let's go into Doctrine and Covenant section 101. First of all, we're going to find out, um, um, let's just start out here um, in verse one. Verily I say unto you concerning your brethren who have been afflicted and persecuted and cast out from the land of their inheritance. So these are the saints in Jackson County, Missouri who were um, cast out of Jackson County, Missouri. And the Lord goes on and says, I, the Lord, have suffered the affliction to come upon them, wherewith they have been afflicted in consequence of their transgressions. So that's why they were allowed to be cast out, because of their transgressions. And then we're going to go on to verse 6. Behold, I say unto you, there were jarrings and contentions and envyings and strifes and lustful and covetous desires among them. Therefore, by these things, they, they polluted their inheritances. So, um, the only reason why they were allowed to be cast out is because they were not a Zion people. They were not living the laws of Zion, which is that we would have everything in common, that we would love our brethren as ourselves. They were not living that. And that is why they were thrown out. And as a matter of fact, coming to the time that Zion um, will be redeemed, um, it says in verse 11, My indignation is soon to be poured out without measure upon all nations. So that is the great and terrible day of the Lord. That is the end of the world. Okay, so that hasn't happened yet. It says, and this will I do when the cup of their iniquity is full. And in that day, all who are found upon the watchtower, or in other words, all mine Israel shall be saved. And they that have been scattered shall be gathered. And all they who have mourned shall be comforted. And all they who have given their lives for my name's sake shall be crowned. Therefore, let your hearts be comforted concerning Zion. For all flesh is in my hands. Be still and know that I am God. Zion shall not be moved out of her place. Notwithstanding, her children are scattered. They that remain and are pure in heart shall return and come to their inheritances. They and their children with songs of everlasting joy to do what? To build up the waste places of Zion. So we need to understand that Zion is in a state right now of um, being in complete shambles. He describes it as the waste places of Zion. Okay. And I want you to remember verse 12. In that day, all who were found upon the watchtower, or in other words, all mine Israel should be saved. Because this watchtower is about to come up in the parable of the redemption of Zion. So let's um, go ahead and come down. And we're going to start reading that parable. Let's see where it is. All right. In verse 43, he says, And now I will show unto you a parable that she may know my will concerning the redemption of Zion. Because remember, Zion is laid waste at this point. And Zion is not just talking about Jackson County, Missouri. Zion is talking about the condition of the church as a whole. We never established Zion. We never became a Zion people. The redemption of Zion has not yet occurred. We are not living the celestial law. Okay. So let's see what his will is concerning the redemption of Zion. A certain nobleman had a spot of land, very choice. Now, this very choice 
harkens us back to the Book of Mormon, where we're told um, by Jesus Christ in Third Nephi, and also by, um, wow, it's in a few places actually. It's in the Book of Ether, and then it's also um, in the writings of Second Nephi that um, the land that they were led to um, was a very choice land. So this is talking about um, what is today the United States of America, okay? So a certain nobleman had a spot of land, very choice. And he said unto his servants, Go ye into my vineyard, even upon this very choice piece of land, and plant twelve olive trees. So the twelve olive trees, the nation of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel. So set up Israel. And remember what we just read in verse 12. It says, and in that day, all who are upon the watchtower, or in other words, all mine Israel shall be saved. So that's what they were doing. Um, Zion is about setting up Israel. Okay. A certain nobleman, back to verse 44, I'm in Doctrine and Covenant section 101. A certain nobleman had a spot of land, very choice. And he said unto his servants, go ye unto my vineyard, even upon this very choice piece of land. And, and plant twelve olive trees, and set watchmen round about them, and build a tower. Remember the tower? All those that are found upon the tower, okay? And set watchmen round about them, and build a tower, that one may overlook the land round about, to be a watchman upon the tower, that mine olive trees may not be broken down when the enemy shall come to spoil and take upon themselves the fruit of my vineyard. So the enemy is going to come. And he's going to take the fruit of his vineyard. Right? Um, he says he's going to come. And that they've got to build this tower. So that the olive trees are not broken down. Or in other words, that his vineyard is not laid waste. Or in other words, that the um, establishment of Zion isn't destroyed. Okay, that Israel, um, as it becomes a nation again, and um, that that is truly established. Verse 46, Now the servants of the noblemen went and did as their Lord commanded them, and planted the olive trees, and built a hedge round about, and set watchmen, and began to build a tower. And while they were yet laying the foundation thereof, by the way, you may want to do your own study about this tower. I think that it um, correlates to what in the Book of Mormon is called the Holy Order. So you may want to look that up and see what that is. And while they were yet laying in today, we would call it the, Melchiz the Order of the Melchizedek Priesthood, the Order after the Son of Man, the Order of Enoch. Okay, verse 47. And while they were yet laying the foundation thereof, they began to say among themselves, And what need hath my Lord of this tower? And consulted for a long time, saying among themselves, What need hath my Lord of this tower, seeing this is a time of peace? Might not this money be given to the exchangers? For there is no need of these things. So shouldn't they put their efforts towards other endeavors, right? Um, not in building the very high tower. Um, like I said, the order of Melchizedek, the, the order of Enoch, right? We don't want to, as it talks about in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, just like Moses taught plainly um, and um, prepared and urged his people uh, that they might sanctify themselves so that they could behold the face of God, but they refused, okay? They didn't want to come up to the order of Enoch, which is required in order to be a Zion people. They didn't want to go through the sanctification process to build that high tower. They didn't want as individuals. They said, no, Moses, you go up and talk to God and uh, converse with him and be our intermediary. We don't want to go through the work of 
climbing that high tower, or in other words, of being able to see God face to face ourselves. Okay, and that is that that is that is what we have to do. We have to enter into the holy order as a people in order to be a Zion society. So might not this money or this effort or this time be given to the exchangers for there's no need of these things. And while they were at variance one with another, they became very slothful and they hearkened not unto the commandments of their Lord. That's correct. So section 42, which teaches them the laws of being as I in people, which includes the law of consecration, you know, and shouldn't we give the money to the exchangers, right? Instead of uh, devoting their property, consecrating it to the Lord and actually truly entering into um, uh, the order of consecration, um, they weren't willing to do it. Um, and while they were at variance one with another, they became very slothful and they hearkened not unto the commandments of, the, of their Lord. And the enemy came by night and broke down the hedge. And the servants of the noblemen arose and were affrighted and fled. And the enemy destroyed their works and broke down the olive trees. I'm wondering if, I, I don't know if that's what this is, but the thought just came into my mind that breaking down the hedge were Joseph and Hiram acting as a hedge of protection for the saints. And when we lost them, then the servants of the noblemen arose and were affrighted and fled. And the enemy destroyed their works and broke down the olive trees. We did not establish Zion. The nation of Israel was not established. Verse 52, now behold, the noblemen, the Lord of the vineyard, called upon his servants and said unto them, Why? What is the cause of this great evil? Ought ye not to have done as I commanded you? And after ye had planted the vineyard and built the hedge round about and set watchmen upon the walls thereof, built the tower also and set a watchman upon the tower and watched for my vineyard and not have fallen asleep lest the enemy should come upon you. And behold, the watchman upon the tower would have seen the enemy while he was yet afar off. And then he could have made ready and kept the enemy from breaking down the hedge thereof and saved my vineyard from the hands of the destroyer. So we need to understand that the church right now in its current state is in the hands of the destroyer. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto one of his servants, Go and gather together the residue of my servants, and take all the strength of mine house, which are my warriors, my young men, and they that are of middle age also among all my servants, who are the strength of my house, save only those whom I have appointed to tarry. And go ye straightway unto the land of my vineyard, and redeem my vineyard, for it is mine, I have bought it with money. Wherefore, get ye straightway unto my land, break down the walls of my enemies, throw down their tower, and scatter their watchmen. Right? And inasmuch as they gather together against you, avenge me of mine enemies, that by and by I may come with the residue of my house and possess the land. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm understanding from this. I'm going to show you other scriptures um, that relate to this. But I'm going to encourage you that the only way you're going to find truth is to let the Holy Spirit guide you to get into these scriptures and read and ponder them and study them for yourselves. And don't, don't rely on my understanding. I'm only telling you these things that it might begin to open your mind and um, encourage you to ask questions of the Lord yourself. Not because I believe that everything that I'm understanding is 
is the absolute um, truth. I could very well be misinterpreting things. And the Holy Spirit is the one that will guide you into that understanding. So let me just go back to where I was here now that I've said that. Um, um, first of all, so historically, we have the account of the Camp of Zion that where Joseph Smith gathered some men together and they were going to go and redeem um, Jackson County, Missouri. Um, and that um, came to nothing, right? But, so I thought about that and I thought, well, so does that just mean that this was a conditional um, prophecy um, and it's just not going to be fulfilled, right? And God has another plan. Well, if you read through the parable of the vineyard, um, it's not conditional. It doesn't say if then, okay? And if you go to Doctrine and Covenant section one, it says, um, it says, search these commandments for they are true and faithful and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. So this has not been fulfilled. Okay. The, the, the vineyard has not been redeemed. Um, we are still in a state of being um, scattered and broken. And so this, where it says in verse 57, therefore go ye straightway unto my land, break down the walls of mine enemy, throw down their tower and scatter their watchmen. That has not yet happened. So with that in mind, let's go and see um, what the Lord says about that. So I'm looking for, I've got these sections pulled up because what I'm working with here is clunky. Let's look at what this redemption looks like. So here in Doctrine and Covenant section 103, he goes on and he talks about this a little further. He says, um, let's see. All right. For starting in verse 12, for after much tribulation, as I have said unto you in a former commandment, cometh the blessing. Behold, this is the blessing which I have promised after your tribulations and the tribulations of your brethren, your redemption and the redemption of your brethren, even their restoration to the land of Zion to be established, no more to be thrown down. Okay. That's the redemption of Zion, a restoration to the land of Zion even. Nevertheless, if they pollute their inheritances, they shall be thrown down for I will not spare them if they pollute their inheritances. Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. Therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. For ye are the children of Israel and the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be led out of bondage by power and with a stretched out arm. And as your fathers were led at the first even so shall the redemption of Zion be. Therefore, let not your hearts faint. For I say not unto you, as I said unto your fathers, mine angel shall go up before you, but not my presence. But I say unto you, mine angel shall go up before you, and also my presence. And in time, ye shall possess the goodly land. Okay. So this is what the redemption of Zion is going to look like. It's going to involve someone being raised up with the power in the priesthood, okay, at the order of Enoch. Remember, Enoch in the book of Moses, we find out, was able to move mountains and to move rivers out of their course, right? Just like Moses, you know, he was able to, um, to um, uh, gosh, what is that, divide the Red Sea, and they... Um, were able to walk through on dry ground and do all those mighty miracles before Pharaoh and his kingdom. So this kind of a redemption has, we have not seen this. OK, 
Okay, this has not yet happened. So Zion has not been redeemed. We are not in the stakes of Zion. Zion does not yet exist. It has to be redeemed. It is in the hands of the enemy right now, which is what we just read in Doctrine and Covenants section 101. Okay, now this is very interesting. As we come down to verse 21, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that my servant Joseph Smith Jr. is the man to whom I likened the servant to whom the Lord of the vineyard spake in the parable which I have given unto you. Okay. And remember it said that he was, the servant was to gather out the strength of his house to go and redeem the vineyard. Okay. So this Moses person that's going to be raised up that has this great power, um, this Moses person is none other than Joseph Smith. Now, how God is going to do that, I don't know. I am well aware that Joseph Smith is dead. But I will remind you that in Doctrine and Covenants section 1, it says, Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. Now, we find out that it couldn't have been the camp of Zion that fulfilled this one because it wasn't done in power and might, right? But then also because we are told here in Doctrine and Covenant section 105, starting in verse 9, Therefore, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion, that they themselves may be prepared, and that my people may be taught more perfectly and have experience and know more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands, right? Because they rejected the teachings of section um, 42, which is the law of living the celestial law, which includes uh, the law of consecration, and we have got to be taught more perfectly concerning this duty. We abandon that and it is not in the church today. And therefore, th that is not Zion. Uh, verse 11, and this cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. Okay, remember the scripture where it says that we have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. We have the priesthood, right? The form of godliness, but there is no power in the priesthood that we're wielding, right? And it says that clearly here in verse 11, and this cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I've prepared a great endowment and blessing to be poured out upon them, inasmuch as they're faithful and continue in humility before me. Therefore, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. Okay, now let's talk about um, how this redemption um, is going to happen. So we know that there's going to be one raised up that is mighty and strong. So, um, in section, oh, that's the wrong section. I need to, um, in a minute, maybe this is where I'm going to be. Nope, it's not. Hang on, let me find the right section. So, section 86 is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Um, it's not 87 that I'm looking for. Ugh, let's see. And it was 85. Um, no, that it is 85. I'm just not seeing it. Um, where is it? Yeah, it is here. Okay. So I'm down in um, verse 7. And it shall come to pass that I, the Lord God, will send one mighty and strong holding the scepter of power in his hand, clothed with light for a covering, whose mouth shall utter words, eternal words, 
while his bowels shall be a fountain of truth. To do what? To set in order the house of God, and to arrange by lot the inheritances of the saints, whose names are found, and the names of their fathers and of their children enrolled in the book of the law. Now remember that we just read um, that um, those who pollute their inheritances are not going to be found in Zion. Um, and it says that right here. While that man, let's keep going, verse 8, who was called of God and appointed, that put forth his hand to steady the ark of God, shall fall by the shaft of death, like as a tree that is smitten by the vivid shaft of lightning. So this person, so there is someone who's called of God and appointed, who has leadership over the people, um, but uh, he is not um, following God's plan, evidently. And um, that man is going to to be smitten, to be brought down. And actually, Isaiah talks about this. I think we'll come back to here. Well, let me just read this part real quick, and then we'll come back. And all they who are not found written in the book of remembrance shall find none inheritance in that day, but they shall be cut asunder, and their portion shall be appointed them among unbelievers, where are wailing and gnashing of teeth. Because they're the ones that polluted their inheritance. They were not willing to sanctify themselves and to be prepared to receive this endowment of power um, so that they might build up Zion. So let's just go back here. So he's going to send one mighty and strong. That's what we just read, right? One like unto Moses, right? And what is he going to do? He's going to put in order the house of God. And it says here, that he will be holding the scepter of power in his hand and he'll be clothed with light for a covering. So I want to go, um, let's see, I want to go over here and pull up. I wasn't planning on it, so I don't have it already up. So give me just a second. I'm going to go to the book of Isaiah and I want to look up um, the thing about Eliakim. And I believe that's Isaiah 22. So I think that's exactly where I need to be. Let me just go into a version that I know how to deal with. We'll go into the chapter and I'm going to read to you. It sounds exactly like what we just read in Doctrine and Covenant section 85. Coming down. Okay, a message for Shebna. This is what the Lord God of hosts says. Go say to Shebna, the steward in charge. So I'm in, uh, by the way, Isaiah chapter 22 starting in verse 15. Go say to Shebna, the steward in charge of the palace. Okay, so this is the one, just like it just said in Doctrine and Covenants. Let me find that where we just were. Section 85. It says, while that man who was called of God and appointed. All right, so this is the steward in charge of the palace. His name in this in, in uh, Isaiah is Shebna. What are you doing here? And who authorized you to carve out a tomb for yourself here, to chisel your tomb in the height and cut your resting place in the rock? Now, this is interesting because I think that this is what um, something that Jesus was trying to help the Pharisees to hearken back to when he talked about the whitewashed tombs, I think. That's what it was, how he said it. Um, let's find it. Um, yes. So I'll just go to Bible Gateway. I think I can do it that way. All right. So it says, let's just go ahead and read that. So he says, um, woe to you. To, uh, so I'm in verse 23 of, darn, where am I? Let me just go up to the top. Matthew 23. So that's a little easy to read, to remember. Matthew 23, verse 23. And remember the next chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, is all about the day of the Lord, right? It's all about um, the, the great day of tribulation at the very end of the world. 
So it's kind of interesting that we go straight from here to there. Um, because I, yeah, anyway. So um, verse 23, it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the in, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. Do you see that? Which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. So, so they are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. So let's go back over here to Isaiah. What does it say? It says, Go say to Shebna, the steward in charge of the palace, what are you doing here? And who authorized you to carve out a tomb for yourself here, to chisel your tomb in the height and cut your resting place in the rock? So this is a the wicked steward, right? Look, almighty oh man, the Lord is about to shake you violently. He will take hold of you roll you into a ball and sling you into a wide land. There you will die. And there your glorious chariots will remain a disgrace to the house of your master. I will remove you from office and you will be ousted from your position. Isn't that interesting? So if we go back over here to Doctrine and Covenants 85, what did we just read? So he's going to send one mighty and strong, holding the scepter of power in his hand, right? While, verse 8, that man who was called of God and appointed, that put forth his hand to steady the ark of God, shall fall by the shaft of death, like as a tree that is smitten in the vivid shaft of lightning. So, you have a steward that's in charge of the house of God. Remember, the enemies right now, according to the parable, of the redemption of Zion, they are the ones who have possession of the vineyard. All right. So this man, the steward, the wicked steward is going to be struck down. And then God is going to put in power his servant and it's going on. So the very next, I'm back in Isaiah 22 again. I'm now in verse 20 on that day. So, um, so he had just removed um, Shebna from his office. On that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash, sash around him. Right? It says that he will be clothed with light for a covering. Doctrine and Covenants, section 85. I will put your authority in his hand. What did it say? And he will have the scepter of power in his hand. Doctrine and Covenant, section 85. And he will be a father to the dwellers of Jerusalem. Right? Because he's going to establish the new Jerusalem. And to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. So he's going to have the priesthood keys. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. So the sealing power. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place and he will be a throne of glory for the house of his father. 
And if we go to section 103, it says, and behold, the servant, uh, we can, uh, we'll just read it because I'm going to paraphrase it wrong. Verily, verily, verse 21 of section 103, I say unto you that my servant Joseph Smith Jr. is the man to whom I liken the servant to whom the Lord of the vineyard spake in the parable which I have given unto you. Therefore, let my servant Joseph Smith Jr. say unto the strength of my house, okay, gather yourselves together into the land of Zion. That's what's about to happen, okay? This is talking about Joseph Smith returning, okay? He's the one. I will drive him, verse 23, like a peg into a firm place. And he will be a throne of glory for the house of his father. Verse 24. So they will hang on him the whole burden of his father's house. The descendants and the offshoots. All the lesser vessels from bowls to every kind of jar. Now we're going to go back and we're going to talk about Eliakim. Verse 25. And, I mean Shebna. Um, the, the wicked steward. In verse 25. And that day declares the Lord of hosts. The peg driven into a firm place will give way it will be sheared off and fall and the load upon it will be cut down so you see the load that those that are um those that are hanging upon this wicked servant that's going to be cut down that 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 this wicked servant that's going to be sheared off and fall that load those people who are depending upon that wicked servant are going to be cut down. Now let's go to the parable of the um, the wheat and the tares. I'm going to show you how that all ties in. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servants. I'm in Doctrine and Covenants, section 86, concerning the parable of the wheat and the tares, verse two. Behold, verily I say. The field was the world, and the apostles were the sowers of the seed. And after they've fallen asleep, the great persecutor of the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that maketh all nations to drink of her cup, in whose hearts the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign, behold, he soweth the tares. Wherefore the tares choke the wheat, and drive the church into the wilderness. That exact thing happened, we just read it, um, in the parable of the redemption of Zion. Um, that is exactly what it says here. Um, when it says that, let's see, going back. And the enemy came by night and broke down the hedge and the servants of the noblemen arose, were frighted and fled and the enemy destroyed their works, destroyed the works of the servants, right? So, in other words, brought in um, apostate doctrines. Brought in apostate doctrines, destroyed their works. Because, as it says here, um, and go ye straightway unto the land of my vineyard and redeem my vineyard, for it is mine. Verse 57, therefore, go, get ye straightway in unto my land break down the walls of my enemies. So they not only broke down the vineyard, they not only destroyed the works, but they took possession of the vineyard and built their own walls. It says throw down their tower. They built up a tower. It is an apostate tower. Scatter their watchmen. So they have watchmen. All right. They have leaders. And this is, so hard to take in. I know that it is. Um, so let's go back to section 86. So the exact same thing happened. So the tares were sown among the wheat because the there were still wheat in that day in the vineyard when it was taken over by the enemy. So the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. Yeah. Because even though we have the true doctrines, they're still here in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants in the Bible. Um, what we have, what we're actually um, observing are the doctrines as they have been corrupted. 
Verse 4, But behold, in the last days, even now, while the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word, and the blade is springing up and is yet tender, behold, verily I say unto you, the angels are crying unto the Lord day and night, who are ready and waiting to be sent forth to reap down the fields. But the Lord saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares, while the blade is yet tender, for verily your faith is weak, lest you destroy the wheat also. Right? So the enemy is occupying the vineyard, right? But the enemy cannot yet be destroyed because first the wheat has to be endowed with power from on high. That's what we had just read in Doctrine and Covenants section um, 105. It says here, let's just read that again. Um, let's see. Therefore, verse 9, section 105, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion, that they themselves might be prepared. And this is what God is doing right now. Um, this, this is the calling the wheat out. This is what's happening. The wheat is being called out from among the tares, that they themselves may be prepared, that my people may be taught more perfectly. Those that are being called out from among the tares are those that are searching the scriptures just as they were commanded. Um, Jesus Christ tells us twice in 3rd Nephi that we are to search the prophets, that we are to search the words of Isaiah, right? That we are to search the scriptures. And actually, you know what? I'm going to, oh gosh, I can take you on so many tangents. Um, I suggest that you read Psalms chapter 1, okay? Because it is this beautiful message that he who loves the word of God and treasures it um, becomes like a tree planted by a river and gives its fruit in its season and its leaf never withers, right? We have to treasure up the word of God. That, that is how we become ready to receive the endowment of power. That, verse 10, that they themselves may be prepared and that my people may be taught more perfectly and have experience and know more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. That is what is happening. That is the way that the wheat is being separated from the tares is they're learning their duty. They're reading the scriptures. They're being taught more perfectly. Verse 11, and this cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I've prepared a great endowment and blessing to be poured out upon them inasmuch as they are faithful and continue in humility before me. Therefore, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. So this is what it's talking about. Um, but the Lord saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares while the blade is yet tender, for verily your faith is weak lest you destroy the wheat also. Therefore let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe. Then we shall first gather out the wheat from among the tares. So we wake up to our awful state, as it says in the Book of Mormon. We realize that the church is in a state of absolute apostasy. We go back and we find out what the true doctrine of Christ is, the fullness that is in the Book of Mormon. And that will be the next video that I do. And after the gathering of the wheat, behold and lo, the tares are bound in bundles, and the field remaineth to burn, to be burned. All right? So then they're reaped down, they're cut down. Okay? The tares are bound in bundles, and they're burned. Okay? Just like it says here, in that day declares the Lord of hosts. I'm back in Isaiah chapter 22. The peg driven into a firm place will give way. All right? So this apostate organization, the, the leader 
um, Shibna, the wicked servant, his firm place, in other words, his place of leadership is going to be done away with. It will give way. It will be sheared off and fall. And the load upon it will be cut down. That load are the tares. Those who love and believe a lie. Section 76 talks about that. I guess we better go there. So, um, sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. In Covenants 76. Let me find that for you. All right, coming down um, where it talks about the celestial kingdom, or not the celestial kingdom, the celestial glory. I need to get straight in my head because we, were, I've always had these teachings about the three kingdoms, right? You have the celestial kingdom, the celestial kingdom, and the terrestrial kingdom. But when you read the scriptures, you find out there's one kingdom. There's one king, right? And that's God. Um, what it is, is it's degrees of glory, but there's one kingdom. And so I got to get that straight in my head. I'm sorry. These old teachings are still there, very strong in my head. Um, let's see, where does it start talking about the celestial kingdom? Uh, okay. Um, all right. And the glory of the celestial is one, even as the glory of the stars is one. For as one star differs from another star in glory, even so differs one from another in glory in the celestial world. For these are they who are of Paul and of Apollos and of Cephas. Okay. So these are they who are listening to and following men who never quite get the vision that... Um, all things point us to Christ, that he is the one that we're supposed to follow. Let's go to verse 100. These are they who say they are some of one and some of another, some of Christ, some of John, some of Moses, some of Elias, some of um, Isaiah, and some of Isaiah, and some of Enoch. Right? So they are those that are believing in men and making flesh their arm, okay? But received not the gospel, neither the testimony of Jesus, neither the prophets. Now these prophets are talking about the Old Testament prophets. Um, I can prove that to you in the scriptures, but I better stop because this is gonna get to be such a long teaching. Anyway, neither the prophets, neither the everlasting covenant. Go back and look at my video on what the new and everlasting covenant is. Last of all, these are all they who will not be gathered with the saints. Right? We just talked about gathering out the wheat. All right? Because these are the tares. To be caught up into the church of the firstborn. Church of the firstborn is um, um, the is uh, the Enochian order. Okay? The order of Enoch. The um, order after um, the firstborn, right, which is Jesus Christ, who will not be caught up into the church of the firstborn and received in the cloud. These are they who are liars and sorcerers and adulterers and whoremongers. And here's the important part that I want you to see that it says, and whosoever loves and makes a lie. So if we love the lies, the apostate doctrines, those are the tares. The ones who hang themselves on the wicked servant, who is Shebna, instead of allowing the true servants, the true prophets and apostles, to point them to Christ. These are they who suffer the wrath of God on earth, right? Because they're going to be burned. They're to be gathered up and burned. These are they who suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. These are they who are cast down to hell and suffer the wrath of Almighty God until the fullness of times when Christ shall have subdued all enemies under his feet. 
and shall have perfected his work. When he shall deliver up the kingdom and present it unto the Father, spotless. I am so grateful that Heavenly Father had such wisdom as to choose Jesus Christ, who is faithful and who will see the end of his work and will deliver up the kingdom and present it unto the Father, spotless, saying, I have overcome and have trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Then shall Jesus be crowned with the crown of his glory to sit on the throne of his power to reign forever and ever. Praise God. Um, so these are the tares, the ones who um, lean upon the armed flesh. I'm going to take you to Doctrine and Covenants really quickly. Um, section one, there's something I want to read to you out of there. Um, This is why you have to search the scriptures because the only way to um, put this puzzle together and to understand it is to allow the Holy Spirit to truly guide you, to truly get in there and seek the scriptures. Um, okay. Let me just find the verse I'm looking for. Um, now this is interesting and the, verse 14 and the arm of the Lord should be revealed remember the arm of the Lord revealed that's going to be Joseph Smith that that is um, um, the mighty man like unto Moses anyway and the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord neither the voice of his servants neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles the Old Testament prophets and the 12 apostles shall be cut off from among the people. That's what we just read. They're the tares. They're going to be bound in bundles, right? And why? Because they've strayed from mine ordinances and broken mine everlasting covenant. Please see the video I did about what the everlasting covenant really is. Okay? And they've strayed from mine ordinances, right? They set up their own tower. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. Wherefore I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon who? My servant Joseph Smith Jr. And spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments. Okay. And section 42 that tells us what the celestial law is and how to live it. And also gave commandments to others that they should proclaim these things into the world. And all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. This is where I, what I wanted to make sure that I read to you, though. That man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh. Okay? We are not to seek the counsel of a man. It doesn't matter who that man is and I'm going to say right now that includes the prophet the prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints we are not to follow his counsel we are to follow the Holy One of Israel and I don't know if I should say this here but it really disturbed me when he went when the prophet went to um, have an interview with the Pope and he came out gushing about it and he called him His Holiness. He didn't have to call him His Holiness. He could simply call him the Pope. But he chose to use that title and he used it twice. There is only one Holy One of Israel and that's Jesus Christ. That title does not belong to the Pope or indeed to any man. The Holy One of Israel is Jesus Christ. That really bothered me. Anyway, that man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh, but that 
every man might speak in the name of God, the Lord, even the Savior of the world. Right? That's exactly what we, so section 84, that he sought diligently that Moses did, that the, the, that, that they might sanctify themselves, that they might, he might present them to God face to face, but they would not, right? And they said instead, Moses, let you speak to God and tell us what he says. That's not what it says, verse 20, but that every man might speak in the name of God, the Lord, even the Savior of the world, right? That we might be endowed with power from on high, that we might be more perfectly taught. And why do we have to do this? Verse 21, so that faith, that faith might also, that faith also might increase in the earth. Why? Why? Verse 22, that my everlasting covenant might be established. The everlasting covenant is that the city of Enoch, the church of the firstborn, will come down and that Christ himself will tabernacle with us on the earth, that all things will be rolled together in one in Christ. That is the everlasting covenant. 23, that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. The fullness of my gospel. The fullness of my gospel is when we've entered into the everlasting covenant. It's when we're a Zion people. What we are sharing now is not the fullness. It is not the fullness, but it is still in the wisdom of God that things happened the way they did. Because by going out and preaching the gospel, even the perverted form that we have, it puts into the hands of the people the scriptures, the word of God, the book of Mormon, the doctrine and covenants, the pearl of great price, the Bible, and, and the, um, the, um, oh my goodness, my brain's not working. Um, the, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. Um, the translated, the, 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 the retranslated sections of the Bible. Okay although they're hidden in the study helps um, in the concordance instead of within the scriptures themselves, still they're there. So the fullness is in the scriptures. It may not be in the church, but it is in the scriptures that have come to us through the conduit of the church. Glory be unto God. He knows what he is doing. And the wheat, his sheep will hear his voice. They will search those scriptures and the truth will be known. And they will be gathered out from among the tares. It will happen. So um, there's so much more that could be shared. But I know this video is long enough. And um, so I'll stop there. Um, um, someone asked me about where I got my copy of the scriptures, which included the... Um, the um, translations by Joseph Smith of the Bible within the Bible itself. Um, they're called um, the reformatted scriptures. This was put together by um, a gentleman who dearly loves God's word. Um, and you can just freely download the PDF version or you can purchase a printed copy, however you want to do it. Um, and I was going to say, oh, if you look up here at the top, this is found at measuringdoctrine.com forward slash reformatted, um, dash scriptures forward slash. All right. So that's where I got them. And you're just going to click on it. Like here's Old Testament volume one. And if you're doing the PDF and it's just simply the PDF is going to download. And since I've already done this, let me just go ahead and scroll through until, um, so this is Genesis and I'm going to go to Genesis chapter nine and I'm going to read 
that one thing to you that is so beautiful. It says, I went past it. Yep, I'm in 10. It says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, I'm in verse 8. And I, behold, I will establish my covenant with you, which I made unto your father Enoch concerning your seed after you. And it shall come to pass that every living creature that is with you of the fowl and of the cattle and of the beasts of the earth that is with you, which shall go out of the ark, shall not altogether perish. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, which I made unto Enoch concerning the remnants of your posterity. And God made a covenant with Noah and said, This shall be the token of the covenant I make between me and you. And for every living creature with you for perpetual generations, I will set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be in the cloud and I will remember my covenant, which I have made between me and you for every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth, and look upward. Then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is my everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will establish my covenant unto thee, which I have made between me and thee for every living creature of all flesh that shall be upon the earth. So there you are. That is the everlasting covenant. That is the entire story of the doctrine and covenants. That this great marriage of the lamb to his bride is going to occur, which is the healing of the breach the healing of the divorce or separation between um, God's throne and the earth, that the Zion that is above will come down and be with the Zion that is beneath, and all things will be rolled together in one in Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I say this in his name. Amen.